So briefly, we kind of got to go through the law on this. Um, and I, I hate doing this stuff, so I'm going to go fast. If somebody has questions, just stop me and slow me down. Uh, in California, you get one physical examination as a matter of right. You don't have to get leave of court in order to obtain that examination. But what's great about it is the way the statutes are written, as the plaintiff, you get to set conditions on whatever the exam is. And you have to do it within 20 days of receiving the demand. And you basically send out an objection and conditions list. And we'll give an example in the materials. Um, and, and you just, you get to modify what their demand is, which is kind of a weird thing. Um, and so what we commonly use is different terms that we just uniformly throw in there is that they're not allowed to do any painful tests, even though that's in the statute. We'll explain why you need to have that. Uh, they're not going to make our client just sit in the hall and wait for a half hour like you do at every other doctor's appointment. Our clients are not filling out any forms whatsoever or writing anything down unless it's a mental examination. Um, we're, we're not going to do a medical history. They don't get to ask about their lifetime of medical complaints for the shoulder or whatever the injured area is. Uh, they don't get to talk about the crash. They don't get to take any x-rays. And we want their report within 30 days. And I'll give you the statute for all this as well. And we want the depot of the doctor within 30 days of receiving the report. Why is that now, important to get the depot of the doctor within 30 days? Because they're not ready. They're, they're just not ready. And they don't have any of your retained experts' opinions. A lot of times, they, if you set it up this way, the defense attorneys will forget that they need to send subpoenas for updated medical records. And so you'll get to the depot and the doctor won't have the past six months, the past three months. Um, and you can use that as a lot of cross-examination fodder to kind of beat them up. Um, but if they disagree with any of your terms, it's up to them to move to compel. You don't have to do anything. You just automatically set it, you hold it. And uh, if, if everybody shows up, your terms hold. It's not that they can try to edit them later. They have to move to compel if they don't want your to hold. This, I mean, it's rare that we run into a scenario where a defense attorney actually knows this. And so a lot of the times what'll happen is we'll, we'll get there and the doctor won't even have our objections in a set of terms. And they, they won't either, they'll try to not agree to them or they'll just get frustrated. And you can hear it on the audio recordings. Um, one of the big issues with physical examinations, and it's kind of a gray area in the law, is whether or not they're required to list the tests. So we always put that in a uh, in as a term that they have to give us the listing of the tests before we'll show up. And the reason that it's kind of a gray area is because Section 2032.220 controls what their the demand is required to state, and you'll notice on there it doesn't say diagnostic tests uh, and procedures. Well, if you go to the, the section that controls an order compelling one of these exams, it does list that. And so usually what we'll say is, listen, if you wanna fight me, go ahead, but the, you're gonna to have to put an order with the list of procedures in anyways. Uh, and so that's how we try to get it. Um, and th there's some vague interpretations on the law for this. There's a case called Carpenter, which is kind of the first case that you need to read. I don't, I don't really know of many others in California that are as beneficial in interpreting these laws. Um, but what it says is that for the first physical exam, you don't need to list the tests. Now, I don't think that that's true. And I'll explain to you why, and there's an argument for it. Because in the other statutes, there's rules that say that the examination cannot include any diagnostic test or procedure that's painful. Well, how am I supposed to know if he intends on doing a painful test if I don't know what test he's gonna administer. And then the other one is we get an observer and it says that the observer is there to make certain that he doesn't engage, the doctor doesn't engage in any unauthorized diagnostic tests and procedures. How, how's the observer supposed to know if we don't know what the tests are? Thankfully, we don't really run into this problem. We've never lost this fight. Andy, I don't know about you, have you ever lost this fight? The answer is no, because a, a couple things. When, when I do send the objection, you know, and, and reference this specific 
uh, code section and, and explain, hey, you have to specifically list each test. Uh, they, they normally amend the response or uh, amend the demand and they include the list. The, the other thing also is that with the physical exams, uh, and much more so than you know the neurological exams or the uh, the uh, psych exams, the the physical exams I'm not too concerned about you know the doctor or the defense attorney giving me an exhaustive list of each test because it, in my experience 99.9 percent .9 of the time the tests depending on the specialty are always the same. And uh, they're, they're uh, fairly straightforward and it's typically an in and out. Uh, it's a quick exam. So I, I do push back initially and almost every single time I get a list once I uh, object. So I, I've never forced a defendant to move to compel uh, on this specific issue relating to the physical exams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the only time we've ever actually done it is when it's turned into like a package deal, like you have a catastrophic case. And since you're already fighting the three or four other exams that they want, you might as well just throw this one in. Yes. And when we've done that, we've, we've not only won, but we've actually gotten them sanctioned. I think most recently we had one for like, maybe we got like three grand or four grand in sanctions, which is pretty hefty out in the AV. Um, so, but anyways, when it comes to how they're supposed to list the test, this is always a huge debate. Uh, you, you almost invariably get the usual, it's just a standard orthopedic examination with standard orthopedic tests. And what's nice is the Carpenter decision has already addressed that for you. They don't get to do that. They don't get to do written standardized tests. They don't get to say, anything beyond a specific listing of what the tests are. And Carpenter does a really good job of going through how detailed it has to be. And it's not just the tests that have to be in detail too. It has to be in detail for who conducts the exam, where it's at, when it's at, uh, any of the conditions, the scope, et cetera. And that'll be important later on, particularly the who will conduct the examination portion, because that's a lot of, that's a, big issue that defense attorneys, if they're trying to be sneaky, can uh, screw up your exam on. But when it comes to how specific it says, it says it has to be fully in, de in detail and to list them by name. Now, the reason we sometimes will fight it for the physical exam is because of the no painful test rule. So when you look at a standard orthopedic exam, most of the tests, a positive sign is pain. And so like, here's just a short list of just some of the tests that are almost in every single exam. Most of these are spine tests, spine and shoulder. Um, but all of these tests, positive sign is either pain or discomfort in some way. And so you can really limit an examiner's ability to examine your client by fighting the no painful test and prohibiting them from doing things like a Sperling's test or even like a straight leg race. And it's, it's kind of, it's nice when you do it this way because these are technically considered objective tests. They're objective findings. So when they try to come in and say that your client is not that hurt or is embellishing or is faking, you can use your own doctor's exams where they've used these objective tests or even the treater's uh, objective tests that show that there are objective findings that uh, do not line up with the defense examiners position. Now you won't always get it that way though. Sometimes they're just going to be able to do it. And that's just the way it is. Um, and so you can then go and attack them at depot, but you can only do this if you've already objected and said as a condition and a term, no painful tests. And so here's kind of a good example of that. And this guy, this guy is Dr. Nussbaum. Uh, he was actually pretty abusive to our client during the exam. It was one of those cases where the exam kind of crept up on us and we were trying to get it done, but we didn't get to do the whole battle because we, she was about to have surgery and they didn't know that. And we wanted them to have the exam before the surgery. And that would be that. 
Uh, and so this is how you kind of address it at deposition if they do these painful tests. Okay. Uh, you understand that you weren't supposed to hurt her, right? Yes. You understand that a condition of that examination was that you do not cause her pain. That is correct. How many times did she say ouch during that examination? I don't recall. Did you administer the Sperling's test? I attempted to. And what is the Sperling's test? It's putting the, the uh, neck in extension and rotation. And when she, and I stopped. I didn't, and if you read my notes, I said I could not perform the Sperling's test because of the patient's pain complaint. So in other words, if she, and when she said that hurts, I can't, you know, I stopped. Now, the, in, in addition to which, there, the range of motion is, was not forced upon us. She, it was all her active range of motion. Doctor, you understand that she was the one telling you to stop. What the, she I, told you to stop. And I stopped. You didn't stop when she said, ouch. You continued. And she said, no, stop. Do you recall that? And I did yes. stop. Yes. Do you recall that? Yes. So it wasn't that as soon as she said, ouch, you stopped because you didn't want to hurt her. She had to tell you twice. Isn't that right? I don't recall her telling me twice. She had to say, ouch, and then she said, had to tell you, no, stop. Isn't that right? Yeah. And you just testified that you knew that a condition of that examination is that you were not to cause her pain. Isn't that right? That is right. Yet you decided that you were going to administer a test that you knew could cause pain. It could cause pain, right? <laughs> and so, I mean, that's that's just the one, but I went through every single one with them. Could that cause pain? Yes, you chose to do it anyways. And so it makes him look not only moderately abusive, but also like he's cheating. He's not following the rules. Um, we haven't gotten to trial on that case, but I think it's going to look pretty well. I'm excited for it. I mean, he, he looks like a bully. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, like, you know, she, yeah, I knew she was in pain, but hey, I got to do my test. Yeah, she told me, ouch, but I got to do my test. <laughs> I mean, that's, those are great clips. Well, and the big issue in that case was he said she was catastrophizing. She was, she was malingering because she wouldn't let him perform these tests when they caused her pain. And so that's what we wanted to basically get rid of. Um, and I think it's going to go well. I'm excited for it. Uh, another rule is they don't get to do x-rays, but the requirement on this is you have to give them the x-rays that you do have for whatever area they're examining. Um, usually they get it as a result of subpoenas. Uh, I rarely have an issue with somebody saying I'm going to x-ray it anyways. They can go in and get on a motion to request the x-rays, but I've never had that granted. I've only Eric and Kale, let me get you get your thoughts on this because I've gone back and forth. So uh, I, I think 99% of the time, you know, we have produced all of the imaging for our particular client to defense. And we tell them, hey, share this with your expert. And inevitably you get there and, and the doctor will say, well, we don't have it, it's not in the file. Do you guys ever just say, well, you know, go ahead, take the x-ray. You know, what's gonna show up is this incredible four level fusion uh, that, you know, is, is that your doctor took an x-ray of. So do you ever just let them go ahead and do the x-rays? I've never actually thought of that before, but that is a good idea. I, I think that I, I'm so suspicious of these guys I'm, and I don't know enough about radiology to be able to determine whether or not they'll somehow manipulate the image. That's that's my concern, but it sounds like what you're saying is a great idea. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, that paranoid about it, but I, I just feel like reflexively, I want this examination to be as short as possible. And I want them to say, you know, we are in possession of everything you've already given them. And that's, that's gonna be all the x-rays and MRIs that we've already had in the case. 
Yeah, I mean, I think part of the analysis I do is uh, I, I want to be able when I'm when I'm cross examining the doctor in his deposition and at trial to to tell him or her, hey, we let you do everything you asked to do at the exam, including text, take X rays, right? And, and you got those X rays, right? And boom. Uh, here's the x-ray you took and look at the, the femur rod extending from the femoral head down to the, you know, the top of the patella. That, that's bad, right? <laughs> that's not good to have that. <laughs> so I, they're, they're, and I remember reading the cases uh, when I first started being active in these medical exams about x-rays and, and the concern was overexposure, overexposing your client to radiation. And, you know, is it a valid concern? Sure, of course. But, you know, is it, is it enough to where you're standing in the doctor's office and he or she asks to take x-rays? Are you gonna say, no, no way, you already have the imaging? Or is it path of least resistance on this particular issue you know, best taken and just say, yeah, hey, go ahead, take an x-ray of his, of his shattered hand and, and tell us what you see. <laughs> so that's something that I always do, especially if it's a serious injury and there's hardware that I know is going to show up. Like, hey, ha take as many x-rays as you want. My client's fine with that. So I think that's something to consider, you know, can you pick a fight about it? Sure. But is, is, it, is it worth it? And is there something to be gained by not picking a fight and letting him do it? So just something to think about. Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I've just never thought of it before. And I think that when it comes to these things, there's no hard line rule for just about any of it. Um, I think that if, if you can help make a better record for the cross, do it. Do I it. I always kind of appreciate those those judo moves too, where they're pushing for something, and instead of pushing back against them, you kind of give it to them, and then you punish them with it afterwards. So that would be a good example of, of potentially doing that. I guess the one thing I would I would be reluctant to do is, and it hasn't come up yet. I've only had doctors, defense doctors, ask for X-rays. I haven't yet had a doctor say, can we do a CT or do an MRI? I don't think I'd allow anything beyond an X-ray because especially MRIs, those, uh, you know, that's when you're getting into to some subtle areas that, you know, can it be manipulated or can you get a bad angle on something? I think so. Yeah. X-rays are X-rays, yeah. you know, especially when you, when you have hardware, so. Yeah, and I think on that point, especially for the MRIs, because I like crossing them, especially the ortho guys on how short they were with my client, short of time. So if I can get that exam down to seven minutes, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> and I, I mean, we've, we've been successful on that before. Um, so it, it depends on the scenario. If I've got a judge that gave them, for example, a medical history, which we'll talk about next, then I'd probably be open to the x-ray because time, they're gonna have enough time anyways. Um, Andy, we got a question from Jeffrey Wilson. Have you come across uh, setting the terms in federal court at all? No, federal court, I, I haven't. Um, I, I would think, I mean, if you're in there on diversity, they're going to be applying, or I think, you know, I have to go back to law school, <laughs> but I would think it, they'd be applying the, the procedural laws or the substantive laws of California in which case, you know, it would be California law relating to DME. So if that's the case, then the, the, I, would, I would proceed in the same fashion. Um, but otherwise I haven't done any, you know, federal law on, on defense medical exams. Have you guys? Yeah, no, we, we generally try to avoid federal court like the plague. Yeah. Something about a unanimous jury that really doesn't tickle my fancy. <laughs> Yeah, seriously. <laughs> uh, an individual that would probably be a good resource for anything federal rules related is Justin Kahn. I know he's got a number of treatises and I actually see him commenting on it here. So <laughs> you shoot him an email and he'll probably have some good insights. Um, 
All right, let me get back on this. So the, I think that the biggest one that we fight and we fight it every time is the medical history. Um, Cause this is where, and we were all joking about it before we got on this, that this is where the doctors will ask the most absurd questions. They'll ask, were you on your phone at the time of the collision? <laughs> Uh, it's just stupid things like that. I mean, I, I fight it every time. I, Eric fights it every time. Andy, do you, I assume you're the same way. No, it, it's uh, the answer. Is, the short answer is yes. The, the more subtle answer is at least with it, when it relates to just their medical history, not because, you know, the accident history or the mechanism of injury. That's another area I'm sure we're going to talk about. But with respect to the medical history, I do have some clients who are incredible historians. They're thoughtful, they're accurate, and they're honest. Um, and when, and it doesn't happen often, but when I get those clients, they, he or she, they're, they're more than happy to, to freely share with this defense expert Oh, you want to know about you know the, the chronology chronology of my history um, with this injury, and in those situations, I don't have a problem with my client you know giving some you know uh, in effect a speech about their injuries and their and their medical history, but those that's an outlier, yeah. and like what you suggested, Carol and Eric, ninety eight percent of the time it's like hey dude. You have my client's medical records. You have his or her deposition transcript when they were already asked this stuff. Look at that. What I liked about your article too, and what we picked up is, is bringing the plaintiff's deposition transcript to the doctor and be like, Here is, here's the facts as they relate to the case that you need to know. You can't ask my client any of these kind of questions. It's, uh, this is something I, I think is, is hugely important and can give you, I think, a, an important advantage is I go into these medical exams thinking or believing the doctor was not provided anything by the defense counsel, even though they should have been. And uh, I, I put on my, on the record, I'm, I will probably talk about recording these exams, but I, when I'm recording the exam, hey doctor, I don't know if defense counsel has provided this to you yet, but on this flash drive and in this folder is here's a list of everything that I brought to you, doctor, including Eric, as you mentioned, my client's deposition. And I always try to, hey, have you read my client's deposition yet? So I'd like to see if I can get that on the record before the exam begins. Um, but bringing information, photos, videos that are helpful to your case to this doctor gives you an advantage because you can ask uh, that doctor in the deposition, hey, did, did you have this before you met with my client? Did you review it before? Oh, so the first time you saw it, the first time you saw the video or photo, whatever it is, was when I brought it to you? So that's something that I, I think is a good practice uh, to follow when you're, when you're accompanying your client. Yeah, and what I think what you got to realize too is when you're recording the exam, which is coming up, you're writing the evidence for the exam. I think it's one of the rare scenarios in which you actually get to write the evidence for an event in your case. And so use it, abuse it. I mean, go wild in there. Just make certain you look uh, demure and you don't look like you're being seedy. That's, that's the biggest thing. Um, and when I say look, I mean sound because you only get audio exams. Are you? Well, let's go into, I think we're going into that, right? Well, we're going to finish up the, uh, base. Before we do that, Cal, let me ask you, cause there seems to be some confusion in the, with some people, the difference between trial lawyers college and trial lawyers university, but you're a graduate of the trial lawyers college, right? I am. In fact, you were at the last class before the pandemic. I think I was the second to last class. All right. And so. What's the difference in your, you know, in your experience between just so because I want anybody to be confused, trial lawyers college and trial lawyers university. So what would you say the difference is? Well, 
I, I mean, one, I'm not in the middle of Wyoming or some other country bumpkin area with no cell service. <laughs> I'm actually in my home on my computer. And two, I, th I think they always call it the trial lawyers call it the method and all that other stuff. Um, that's, that's not how this is. I mean, this is actual, here are digesting of specific cases. Here are specific litigation issues that you deal with from people who have been through them and done them before. And I, I mean, trial lawyers college doesn't do that. You, you basically get a sample case of yours that you get to work with some people and use the method, which I always thought was weird why they called it the method. It sounds kind of voodoo-y to me, but. All right, so anyway, anyway, I think there are night and day, there's a night and day difference. I think it's pretty obvious there's a night and day difference. I mean, especially this is a virtual platform. It's on demand. It's available all the time. Tyler's College is supposed to be an in-person experience. They, in fact, that's what they advertise is that you have to separate yourself from the rest of society in order to go through it. Dan, I've never had you ask me to separate <laughs> from the rest of society. <laughs> you wouldn't want to do that with Dan. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, I'm joking, Dan. You're great. I love it. Just want to clarify that. Keep going, though. You're doing great. <laughs> so I, I mean, disclaimer every day, so that nobody's ever confused. I think it's pretty obvious, but I don't think I really need to go into too. Not much everybody more. does. That's why I'm in a lawsuit, apparently. <laughs> well, I think everybody does, but not everybody wants the same things that we want here. So that's why you're in a lawsuit. But anyways, enough on that. Can we go back to teaching, Dan? Yes, we can. All right. Technical uh, aspects of something. Technical aspects of something on demand virtual. Um, so I want to talk about kind of the statutory authority on the medical history. Uh, the best, there's a number of arguments out there. There's a couple of criminal cases that, there's one actually that I found that makes a soft distinguishment between a physical examination and a medical history. I haven't had much success doing it that way. I've found that the best measure that I've been able to pull off is making a basic statutory construction argument. Um, and you use the statutory construction rule that where the legislature makes a distinguishment between two items in the same statutory uh, chapter that there's an effect and an intent behind that. And so when you look at the what the one physical examination statute is, it literally says one physical, and the key word there is physical examination. But there's also a distinguishment that's actually made and it's kind of hidden. It's in the statute that governs the expert giving you a report and it separates out the difference between a history and an examination, that the report is required to have a history as well as the examination. And so the argument there is essentially that by separating those two out, the legislature specifically intended that the physical examination is just that and that it doesn't include a history because the report is supposed to have a history and the reason for that is it's based off of the medical records that are supposed to be provided. Um, and in support of that, we, we've got a number of cases. Uh, what's nice about the cases that interpret 2032 is every single time that I found, it's always strict interpretation. It's always plain language of the statute. It's, I, I can't even, I don't, Dan, Andy, have you ever found one that says it's not plain language? Never. Eric, have you? I mean, I. No, I think we've, we've pretty exhaustively researched these cases. And so it's, it's nice to have these listings. And I think we even have in one of our briefs, it's a half page that basically says strict interpretation, strict interpretation, plain language, plain language. Um, and so that's, you can use that and we'll give you all of this. And a lot of the times what people counter with that the defense attorneys say is, well, but that's not fair. Your doctors get to do a medical history. Ours should get to do a medical history. Well, courts address that one too, thankfully. Uh, in Brown versus Superior Court,